lesson, we will begin going through the things that you think about when you talk about the book of Revelation. Uh, next week, we'll talk about the seven seals. Uh, they'll come out with little balls on their noses and like shoot up in the air. <laughs> 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 and, and it was kind of a rough crowd tonight. Uh, and uh, we'll go through the seven seals and then we will go through the trumpets and we'll begin to kind of move beyond our initial timeline. And so we're, we're heading toward the meat of the matter, as it were. Today we're going to kind of, kind of do a little retrograde motion. We're going to go back to Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5, which is where it all kind of got started with John in the book of Revelation and kind of filling some gaps. Everybody say yay? yay. So we've covered a lot. Um, I know there's been spring break since between this and the last lesson. So for those of you that are here in person, we had two weeks off. But we, we've learned a lot. We've learned the secret uh, of, of studying end time prophecy is to find as many scriptures as possible about the same event and let scripture interpret scripture, right? Amen. And we found that we do that. We find other details. And then to look for clues of how everything lines up, okay? And so we've took, taken some pretty broad panoramic views and, uh, and, and covered several different visions. And it's fixed to get a lot narrower. We get the seven seals, it kind of starts narrowing down. Seven thunders, it gets really narrow. Seven, uh, the seven, uh, I should say trumpets, and then the seven thunders, and then the seven vials. It keeps getting narrower and narrower, and then we'll move forward, okay? So it's fixing to really, really take off, I promise. Uh, but we need to kind of go back, because I promised you we would do every prophetic passage in the book of Revelation, and we want to be sure we cover our bases. So we're going back to Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, and we're going to go through Revelation 4 and 5, which was chronologically, at least as far as it was delivered to John, was the very first vision that he recorded of end time prophecy. Y'all with me? Okay. So Sister Jean's going to read because she was looking at me at the right spot time. Revelation 4 and 1. Take it away. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of the trumpet, speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Okay, so this is the very first vision, and I've already discussed the very first lesson why I do not believe that Revelation 4 and 1 is the rapture of the church. I believe that God was calling John and John alone up into the heavenlies to see some visions. I don't believe this is the rapture of the church, okay? We've already kind of went over that, okay? But this is a beginning, though, and it's a beginning because if you go back to Revelation 119, which is in your, your uh, uh, bottom notes there, footnotes, but not actually in the text. If you go back to Revelation 119, God told John, he said, I want you to write three things. John, I want you to write the things you have seen. Say it with me. Say the things you have seen. The things you have seen. And I want you to write the things which are. Everybody say the things which are. And then, and then he said, finally, I want you to write the things which will take place after these things. Or if you're King James, the things that must be hereafter. Okay? So if you think about it, John was kind of late getting to the writing party. John was the longest lived of the 12 disciples. Uh, he outlived all of them by far. He outlived all of them by about 30 or 40 years. Uh, if you do the math, he would have been in his, his early to mid-teens around the time of Jesus' ministry, his mid-teens around the time of the cross. Um, he, he, he never married. He spent most of his time uh, taking care of Mary until she passed away. It was not a romantic relationship. It was a, a, like a son to a, to a mother, basically taking care of her instead of Jesus Christ. And then when she passed away, uh, he, he is an old man. He, his, his ministry sort of expanded. But you're talking about the last 10 years of his life is when he wrote all of his books, okay? And it was only at a commandment of Jesus Christ directly, okay? So if you think about it, he said, again, I'm, I'm, I'm alluding to Revelation 119. <coughs> he said, write the things which you have seen, write the things which are, and then write the things that, that must be after these things, okay? Or the things that are to come. So if you think about it, right, when John got this, this uh, word from God, as it were, he wrote, first of all, the things that he had, he had seen. He wrote the Gospel of John, which detailed his... his and John was, was with him from the beginning because John was a disciple of John the Baptist. And so he was from Jesus' ministry all the way from the beginning, all three years, three, three and a half years, depending on how you count. So John wrote all the, the Gospel of John as the things that he has seen. Everybody say, yeah? yeah. And then, that was the past. And then he wrote the things that are. He wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John to people in churches and people in the church the situations that were going on then, and also the first uh, the first three chapters of Revelation, Revelation chapter 1, which actually tells Jesus coming to him, but Revelation 2 and 3 um, are, are God showing him some things that were in seven churches in Asia, things that were going on at that time. So he was writing the things that are. He was addressing situations in real churches 
that were really happening during his lifetime, right? Okay. Yeah. But when you get to Revelation 4, he says, after these things I looked, and, and the voice that speaks to him says, I will show you what must take place after these things. So, so John, uh, excuse me, Revelation 4 and 1 is John starting to write the, the future sense of it, okay? So as we, we've seen, some of these visions can reach way back, right? They reach way back and start way back over here, okay? And like you're like, what's this got to do with end time prophecy? Then suddenly we find out where they end up. Suddenly they end up with events. The vision, the culmination of the vision is things that are still yet to come. Does that make sense? And we're going to see the same thing with this vision as well. He, he begins to see the first vision in heaven, and he gets transported into, into the heaven that now is, okay? So this is very, very, very interesting because we're going to get to see how heaven right now <laughs> It is and what it looks like, okay, to some extent, okay? So we're getting in a vision of heaven, and we're going to move forward. Revelation 4 and 2, Sister uh, Michelle, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. Okay, so this is the only detailed look of the heaven that now is, okay? And I use that term, heaven that now is, to differentiate from the heaven that's coming, okay? Right now, we're on the old earth. We're on, the, we're on this earth. If I say the old earth, the old earth. Uh, and, and, my, and eventually the old earth will pass away as will heaven. Heaven and earth will pass away. It will burn up with a fervent heat. We'll cover this in the next to last Bible study or the next to next to last Bible study, okay? Um, and so when that passes away, John eventually in Re Revelation 20 says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem coming out of new, the new heaven to the new earth, okay? And that's the heaven that will be. That that's, that's, what, that's where we will live for forever, okay? But this is the only description in Revelation 4 and 5. It's the only physical description, really, with the exception of maybe a few verses here and there in Isaiah and Ezekiel. This is really the only uh, far-reaching description of the heaven that now is, okay? And one of the things that strikes us is, is that when you look at the heaven that now is, okay, we're going, to event, we're going to go to this heaven, because this is where we'll go with the catching away of the saints. This is where the marriage supper of the Lamb will happen, okay? But we will spend forever one day in the new heaven and the new earth, particularly the new Jerusalem, okay? When we get there, you'll find that the new Jerusalem, which has not yet come, okay? Because there is no new heaven yet, because the old heaven hasn't passed away and the old earth hasn't burn, been burned up. But the new Jerusalem, which comes out of the new heaven to the new earth, will have streets of gold and gates of pearl. Okay, got with me? When we get there. And it's interesting because people a lot of time don't don't think about the fact that there is no streets of gold in heaven right now. Okay? That's in fact there really isn't streets of gold in heaven ever. It's in the New Jerusalem, a city that comes out of New Heaven. So I guess for a time it is, and then comes to the New Earth. <coughs> you grasp what I'm saying, okay? So if you go to a funeral, okay, and you know Sally Mae is laying in the casket there, and and the preacher gets up and says, Sally Mae shall no streets of gold. Well, there's a couple of problems with that. One is Sally Mae may have been right with God. We're not here to dispute that or, or even try to make a judgment on that. But even if Sally Mae was the greatest thing to happen since Simon Peter walked on water, okay? I mean, Sally Mae may have made it, okay? But she's actually in a time of sleep awaiting the resurrection right. of Jesus Christ to come back to take her away to the, to the heaven that now is, okay? Mm -hmm. And she can't be shouting on streets of gold because there aren't streets of gold yet. He's still preparing that, okay? So, you know, some people have very, very limited view of what they... You know of what of what they view as far as heaven, and you know, you know, I'm going to be in these streets of gold, have to wear socks so my feet ain't cold, and all that kind of stuff. That they're not grasping. I just felt a little reggae right there. Um, I was actually hoping Sister Tony would choke on her salad right there, but she she, she saw it coming and swallowed quickly. Uh, but uh, yes, yeah, sometimes you know, and I, I made a statement before: country music, uh, uh, fictional novels, uh, movies, paintings. The History Channel are all horrible commentators on Scripture. I've never seen a History Channel special, not one. I've never seen a fictional novel, even written by Dan Brown. No. I've never seen a painting. I've never heard a country song. <laughs> okay, what am I missing? What was the other one? Novels. What is it? I said fictional novel. The other one. And History Channel. History Channel. Uh, I've never seen any of those. Oh, a movie. 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 <coughs> Never seen them get it biblically right. I've never seen one, ever. Okay. So if you're relying on those mediums to get truth, um, you ought to try shooting for the real thing. Yeah. For those of you on sound, I'm holding up a printed Bible, which is actually the best, usually the best bet. 
I, I haven't seen one movie get it right either. People are all, people uh, every once in a while, I don't know why I get off on this stuff. Why don't I get off on this stuff? It's like, like I get off, I walk off the cliff and just, y'all just let me walk. Y'all wave goodbyes. All the way. <laughs> y'all like smile, I like you're interested, let me get all the way out there and I just drop off. And, but I, people get, every once in a while, get all excited about, you know, some religious movie going to come out, you know, Passion of the Christ or whatever. And, and I just have a hard time getting excited about any of it because when I watch it, or if I were to watch it, which I typically don't for this reason, I'm just sitting there counting all the things they got wrong. They got wrong, exactly. It's hard to, it's hard to enjoy it when they're taking away way much of creative license. So just a thought. We're, we're, we're going to the original. Somebody say, hey. So I'm going to call this the old heaven just for the sake of clarity, okay? So when I say old heaven, I don't mean it like, you know, old woman, like just deploringly, okay? Or, disparag- or you know, disparagingly. I'm saying old heaven as uh, um, contrast with the new heaven that is to come. Everybody with me? Okay, where are we at? Okay, also notice there's only one throne in heaven. Everybody say one throne. One throne. The one who sat on the throne, okay? As we see later, we'll get to it. The one who sits on the throne is none other than the Lamb of God, Jesus the Christ. Somebody say amen. Amen. All right, let's talk about it. Revelation 4 and 3. Uh, Sister Michelle, again. And he who was sitting, was sitting like a jasper stone, and a sardius in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. Okay, so obviously, John's going to run into some trouble here, okay? Now think about it, okay? Before we, before we throw stones at John, I want you to think about what if you were having to describe things that no other human beings on earth have ever seen? Okay? It's your job to describe this, okay, for people of all ages to be able to figure it out, okay? So John's going to run out of words here, okay? He's going to... He's going to He's going to, and this is kind of a key thought to set us up for the trumpets and the seals. He's going to use the vocabulary that he has in his time, in his era. He's going to use things that are familiar to him, okay? He's not going to say shinier than Pastor Sibley's head because he's never seen Pastor Sibley's head. He's going to see, he's going to say, he's going to use gemstones and he's going to use certain things. Doesn't mean that God is a gemstone, it just means that of certain, he's seen bright gems and bright you know, emeralds and things that beauty. He's trying to say it's splendiferous, okay, or splendorific. I'm using tiger, I'm using tigger terms, okay. <laughs> terrific. He's, he's, he's using the, the biggest words that he can, okay, right? Everybody say yay? Yeah. And so what he's saying is, is the one who sat on the throne was incredible, splendorous, okay, glorious, okay. There's a rainbow that stretched all the way around the throne. Everything seemed highly polished. Everything shines with a, with a sheen. Everything, every nothing is dull. Okay, in the heaven that now is, or the old heaven. Everybody with me? Yeah. Okay. Revelation four and four. Go ahead, bro. Around the throne, there are twenty-four thrones, and upon the thrones, I saw twenty-four elders sitting, clothed in white garments. Okay, so you have one main throne. It's pretty obvious there's a throne right in the middle of everything, at the center of everything. And then around the throne, we're setting you up, so hang on a little bit. There are 24 seats or 24 smaller <coughs> thrones with 24 elders, or the term can mean leaders, okay, uh, sitting. And, um, and they had white clothing and they had crowns of gold. Now, a lot of prophecy teachers, I would say probably about 75%, and I know all, you know, all statistics are made up, but uh, 75% of prophecy teachers, give or take a few percent, they will say, well, this represents, you know, this is the 12 apostles, or this is the 12, you know, the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel and the deal. And, you know, they're really close. They almost get it, but they're not quite. I do not believe this is the 12 tribes of Israel. I do not believe this is the 12 apostles, okay? For the simple reason is, is John had to be taken from earth to get there, okay? So Peter and James and some of these guys that had already died, they're not in the heaven that now is. They're awaiting the resurrection. Okay? <clears throat> Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 that, that if we die in Christ, we're not going to, you know, the rapture of church takes place, but it's not going to prevent those that are asleep from going, that the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we who are alive shall be caught up with them to meet them in the air and to ever be with the Lord, okay? My question is, if a saint dies and they're already in the heaven that now is, why is the dead in Christ having to rise? Right. See what I'm saying? Yeah. If, if people die and they're immediately in heaven right then, that second, why does Jesus Christ have to come back to them? Okay? Yeah. And so, so we, 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 get into, we get into some... Somebody says, well, it doesn't really matter. It just makes us feel better. Well, it does matter because if you teach and believe that when people die and they're right with God, they immediately go to heaven, then what it means is, is you're not teaching really 
a whole lot on the coming of Jesus Christ. And so it causes us to not focus on His coming because if people are already there, why, why is it so important to think about getting ready for His coming? Okay? The truth is, the Bible teaches, and I'm, I'm, I'm encapsulating all this in kind of a small little thought. The Bible teaches when the righteous die, and, and whatever the terms of their error are, but they die right with God, they go into a time of sleep, okay, where they can communion with God, but they don't have communion with each other and around. They go into a time of sleep, awaiting the final resurrection. Then they're given their glorified body. Then they'll go to the old heaven, the heaven they're now in. So this whole thing about Sal, Aunt Sally may looking over me from glory, watching my every move, that, that's, that's fiction. That's, that's the only way I put it, okay? And if Sally May has died like five or six years ago, and if she's visiting you at night, you need to realize that's not Sally May. Yeah. That may be a spirit impersonating Sally May. It may be your next-door neighbor playing a trick, but it's not Sally May, okay? And, and if, if you are talking to someone that's putting it off as a dead person, you need to realize that you're probably not you talking with anything that's worth talking to in a spiritual sense. It's pretty dangerous to quote-unquote talk to the dead because yes. you can't talk to the dead. Right. They're in a type of sleep awaiting a resurrection. You're talking to spirits that are impersonating them. Is that with me? So if these people do see Mary, well, the problem is Mary's awaiting the resurrection. So if, if, if they do speak to Mary, they're speaking to somebody or something that's impersonating Mary, and we're getting on dangerous ground, aren't we? Yeah. Y'all with me? Yeah. Um, you're talking about how... I was no mint in heaven, but I remember a story where someone went up to heaven and a um, chariot of fire. Yes, I didn't say there's nobody in heaven. I said that people who die are not immediately there. There are at least two people in heaven because there were two people who did not see death, and that was Enoch and that was Elijah, and we will get to that in Revelation 11. Thank you. <laughs> Good question and a sharp, sharp mind. All right, y'all with me? Y'all live? Yep. We're going to come back to who I think the 24 elders are in a minute, but I'm setting you up for something cool, so you got to hang out with me a little bit. You ready to hang out with me a little bit? Yeah. I've already messed up already messed up your your, uh, your country music theology. I've already messed, messed up all your Facebook posts about Grandma watching over you. <laughs> Grandma may have got run over by a reindeer, but she's not watching over you. <laughs> Revelation 4 and 5. Let's go to something else interesting. Peels. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> that's a peel of money. I know. I know. I see the there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Okay, now this is a magnificent scene. Everybody say yay. yay. Wonderful yay. throne sits with one of the thrones surrounded by a full rainbow. There's the smaller thrones with seats with 24 elders, whoever they are. Uh, there's from the throne, there's lightning, there's thunder. Do I need to demonstrate that again? No, there no, is no. power emanating from the one who rules over the universe. And then we get to something a little strange. We get to there are seven lamps of fire. Everybody say seven lamps of fire. Burning before the throne. And John tells us what they are. These are the seven spirits of God. Now, here, here's where we start to kind of grasp something, okay? We're in the book of Revelation, okay? So, yes, the description is there for a reason, okay? And God, to some extent, wants us to know some facts about the old heaven or the heaven that now is. Am I with me? Yeah. Yeah. But some of these things are, are illusions, or some of these things represent other things. And if we go looking to try to put our personal bent on these things without letting Scripture interpret Scripture, we're going to get to some weird facts, okay? So, for example, now we just have these seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. We are told they are the seven spirits of God, okay? And the problem is, is if you don't realize what the rest of Scripture teaches about the Spirit of God, you're going to get into some weird beliefs, okay? Yes. In fact, some people say there's three gods. Really, I would say you have more Scripture that there are seven gods than there are three. <laughs> if you're going to take every number and apply it multiple, because right. the Bible never uses the word three with God, yeah. but it does use seven a couple of times. Are you all with me here? Yes. yes. Relax. I do not believe there are seven gods. <laughs> what I'm saying is we can't take everything in the book of Revelation as a literal, a literal indicator. Okay? There's got to be a greater truth. We've got to let the rest of Scripture, we've got to find other allusions to the same thing and refer to it. Y'all with me here? Yes. Okay. Now, if we were to do a basic study on the Spirit of God, we know God is a spirit. That's John 4.24. Everybody say a spirit. A spirit. It doesn't say we know God is a spirit. <laughs> okay. Or seven of them. 
God, and it's not siete, it's, it's God is a spirit. Everybody say yay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and we know that there's only one spirit of deity. You can see 1 Corinthians 12 and 12, uh, Ephesians 4 and 4. Uh, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. The Lord, is, the Lord is that spirit. There's one spirit. Everybody say one spirit. Right? One spirit. So there's only one spirit of God. Okay, there's not seven distinct, separate spirits of God. Okay, so what is it referring to then? And and if you look at the rest of Scripture, you will find in the Bible. You have to take the whole Bible for this to work. But if you take Scripture, you'll find that there are seven different ways that the one spirit of God comes into our life to try to manifest itself. In other words, there are seven ways that if we truly let God have His way in our life, mm -hmm. the Spirit of God will manifest itself to us in these seven ways. Y'all with me? Yes. Okay? So just kind of mull on that a little bit. Chew it like a bad piece of chicken. And then, let's kind of, let me just take you through a gander through the Bible. Okay? Let's skip over to Isaiah 11 and 2. And uh, we're somewhere around the corner. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of counsel and strength. Spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. Okay, so the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The Bible's talking about the Spirit of God. Everybody say yay. Yeah. And how it would work in and through the Messiah's life, right? Okay, when Jesus Christ came, when the Christ came, the Messiah, the Spirit of the Lord would be upon him, working through him. Everybody say yay. Yeah. And it gives us three aspects of what the Spirit of the Lord comes to do to work in a human being. The first is the Spirit of the Lord comes to be a spirit of wisdom and understanding. Come on, help me out. Say it with me. Say spirit of wisdom and understanding. Spirit of wisdom and understanding. Spirit of wisdom and understanding. If, if some of you are very discerning, you're realizing that I'm fixing to preach to you, and this has a lot less to do with prophecy as it does to preach into your heart. So get the offering plates ready, okay? Right. So to allow the Holy Spirit complete liberty in our life, we've got to allow it to bring wisdom and understanding. It's not enough just to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit one time, okay? If we don't let the Spirit of God be the number seven, okay, to go back to our text, the number seven, everyone will say is God's lucky number. God doesn't have a luck, and God doesn't have a lucky number, okay? And God has various numbers associated with him, but the number seven repeats itself because the number seven is the number of God's perfect completion. So, so when something has fully been completed and done a full cycle and has come fully to fruition to what God wanted it to be, you will see the number seven stamped in on that. Does that make sense? Yes. As in the seven days of creation. It was good. Okay? Not just the six days of creation, the seventh day of rest, and then it was a complete package. Okay, And that, and that created the week as we know it, and our body is actually aligned to seven days. And we don't have time to chase those rabbits. Are you with me here? Yes. So seven is not God's lucky number. It's not, it's not what you play when you play the lottery and you're going to your last ticket, okay? It's, 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 it's not lucky. It's the fact, it's, it symbolizes, it symbolizes, it's a rough crowd today. I didn't even get like, I'm getting passing smiles. Uh, the, it's, it's the number of God's completion, okay? So when we receive the Holy Spirit, we've got to make sure we have all seven lamps of His Spirit burning in our life or the seven ways that the Spirit of God wants to work in our life. And the first thing is we've got to allow uh, it to bring wisdom and understanding, okay? That, that you've got to allow the Holy Spirit to bring understanding of, and, and reveal things to you, mm -hmm. and wisdom is taking that understanding and applying it to your everyday life, okay? So, so for example, okay, um, you've got to let your, the Holy Spirit deal with certain areas of your life, okay? And, and learn how, how do these biblical principles apply to my everyday life. Wisdom is taking what I understand and applying it to the ways it relates to me. Okay? Right. Right. Um, if, if some of you have heard messages and sermons before you receive the message of the Holy Spirit, and, and you probably hopefully understood something because you kept coming back, but how many of you will say that all of a sudden the sermons really became alive after you received the Holy Spirit because you would go home thinking, oh, he was talking about that, talking about that, okay? Mm -hmm. Or a few days later, you'd be in a situation and you're like, oh, that's what he was talking about. I need to do, okay? So wisdom is the ability to apply that, okay? So the Spirit of God is not just something that we get to, we can check off a list and say, hey, I received the Holy Ghost and hey, you know, I, I received this great supernatural experience. Check, let's go on and keep being the same thing. The Holy Spirit wants to bring understanding and bring wisdom. Somebody say yay? Yeah. The second thing it wants to bring is counsel and strength or counsel and might. And in the original Hebrew, that's literally the words of purpose and power. Everybody say purpose and power. Purpose and so power. the second work of the Holy Ghost in a person's life or God's Spirit in a person's life is to bring a new sense of purpose and to give them the power to fulfill that purpose. It's another way of saying that we should let the Spirit of God change our priorities and change our goals. Okay? Um, I've met more than one person who was very lackadaisical about life and very aimless in life. 
You have to get the Holy Spirit, let the Word of God bring understanding and wisdom, and then let the Holy Spirit be alive in their life, and suddenly they find purposes in their life, a reason to live, and a reason to smile, and a reason right. to get up every morning that they never knew existed, okay? Uh, one of the biggest, I don't know why, again, I'm fixing to walk off the plane, the ergo's going to wave let me go. One of the biggest blights in our age is the drug of depression. Right. Yeah. You know, not yeah. cocaine, yeah. not meth. I met somebody that obviously was doing meth. She's missing all her front teeth. It's like you want to say, hey, it's obvious you do meth. It's not coming to but, but it's not so obvious when you meet people and you don't realize that they're missing their spiritual teeth in the sense they have no spunk, they have no get up, and they're overcome with depression. If we would let the Holy Ghost be what it's supposed to be, you, could, you, could, you would have a purpose in life. You know what I mean? And God would give you the power to fulfill that purpose. Come on, somebody. All right. The third thing is, is the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Okay? So a third work of the Spirit of God in a person's life is to call them to desire an increase of knowledge. Okay? We learn more about the Lord through His Word. We learn Him by trusting Him through trials. Somebody say yay. yay. And the more you know about Him, you say, well, how do I know I'm increasing the knowledge of the Lord? Not just knowledge, but knowledge of the Lord. Well, the fear of the Lord or your respect for the Lord, your healthy, your healthy rever rev reverential respect, that's hard to say three times fast, will increase your, your reverence toward the Lord and your fear of the things of the Lord in a good sense. Fear in a good sense will increase. The more you know about God, the more you realize He is worthy to be praised. I think that a lack of praise in people's life always stems from a lack of revelation and a lack of knowledge of truly how great God is. Exactly. When people just sit in church and won't praise God like they biblically commanded, the issue really is level of knowledge. They really don't have a revelation of how great God is yes. and true knowledge. If they had a great knowledge of how great God is and of how much He has to do in their life yes. and, and determine in their life, they would be quick to obey Him and quick to reverence Him. Just a thought. Just a thought. Somebody say amen? amen. I always get nervous when people study and they become deader as they study. Because they're studying the wrong things. Exactly. <laughs> if you're really increasing the knowledge of the Word of God, you're going to increase in power, in the Holy Spirit, in purpose, in might, in, in understanding, and also in reverence and fear of the, of the Lord. Somebody say yay? Yes. So the Spirit of God comes to do certain things. Y'all with me? Yes. So, so is, uh, Israel. Isaiah has revealed to, to us three aspects. We need seven, right? Yes. There are seven spirits of the Lord or seven ways yes. the Spirit of God yes. makes itself manifest. You with me? Yes. Let's, read, let's fast forward. Hundreds of years later, the Holy Spirit's about to be poured out. Jesus is ready in the disciples for the outpouring of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. And he tells them another aspect of it. We're in John 14, 17. Where are we at? Okay. That is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be. Okay, the Holy Spirit would be the spirit of truth. Somebody say spirit of truth. Okay? Spirit of truth. Okay? And that many people have a form of truth, but when we come to God, we need to let the Holy Spirit uh, uh, tear aside every possible, as my, as my uh, computer goes in the sleep, but I'll say. We need, to let, we need to let the Holy Spirit tear away traditions of men and make sure that in everything we're based upon biblical foundations. Does that make sense? Amen. Okay. We want to be based everything on Bible traditions and not just traditions. If we don't have Bible for what we do, then we need to at least think about why we're doing what we're doing and see what right. the Bible says. Yes. And, and the, Bible, um, the Bible teaches that we should let the Holy Spirit have its full work. Okay? Here, here's the deal. A lot of people receive the message of the Holy Spirit and then just use it to try to validate what, what they've always believed. But really, the Holy Spirit should bring an understanding of right. other things. It should cause you to search out certain things. I'm not right. preaching to the choir. You're the people here on a Tuesday night in the Bible study. I get that, okay? But you, you need to let the Holy Spirit be something in you that causes you to, to question everything in your life. Right. Mm -hmm. okay? In a good way. I don't mean in a bad way. But just to say, do I really have Scripture for this? Is this, this may be what I clung to all my life. This may be lived this, but is this really based off the scriptural model does the scripture really say that, or is this just something that I've clung to and believe? And we need to let the Holy Spirit challenge man made traditions in our life. And then we get to 2 Corinthians 4 13. We're coming around the corner, getting ready to pass the offering plate. Hang with me. Go ahead. But having the same spirit of faith. Okay, and that was a long one, okay? And I actually have a, I actually skipped some stuff. I had a picture you can see here of this. I'm not sure if that's what it looks like, but you know, say a lot of I like this dude. You ever see that guy in church? Uh, but, yeah. 
I've got a surprise later on with some official pictures of heaven later on. I'll show you. Uh, uh, sure enough. Do what? It's, it's, it's not in Texas. There is hell in Texas. But there's, not, there's a hell in Texas, but I don't know if there's it. But, uh, so, spirit of faith. The Holy Spirit tries to be a spirit of faith in a person's life. Spirit of faith is an attitude that says any promise written in God's Word is for me today. You know, women, I'm going to speak it, I'm going to believe it, I'm going to act upon it. Uh, the Holy Ghost comes to remove doubt and seeds of doubt from our life, okay? If you get the Holy Spirit and really activate it, you'll find it's the gift above all gifts. Because not only does it transform you, but it enables you to step out on great things. If you've never received the Holy Spirit, then I, I'm trying to describe snow to people who have never seen snow. And there's some people here today that now have seen snow and I'm glad I can't use them as illustration. But, but you, you, you follow what I'm saying here. We, and then there are, there are people who get the Holy Spirit, then they get over get the Holy Spirit, forgetting what they have. Right. Okay, I've known people get off on weird doctrine that never received the Holy Spirit 30 years ago, but they got off on weird doctrine because they were looking for a new experience in God to try to find something new. When they didn't need a new experience in God, they needed to make full use of what they already had in right. the gift of the Holy Spirit. Right. Y'all with me? Yeah. yeah, okay. Romans 1 and 4 is another one. God, by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. But I say the Spirit of holiness. This is a neglected work of the Spirit of God too, because holiness means separated unto God. Okay, so so separated, made unique. Okay, if we let the Holy Spirit, check this out. This is really this is really hard to understand. Okay, so really <laughs> listen hard. If we let the Holy Spirit have its full work in our life, then the result will always be holiness. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay, I, I, get, I get a little perturbed by some people who claim to be, be, be operating in the fullness of the Holy <laughs> Spirit, and there is absolutely no separation from the world in their life. They just talk in tongues. Yes. Amen. They might have received the Holy Spirit, but they're not letting the Holy Spirit really be holy to them. Okay. So Holy Spirit will want to call us to be holy and separated unto God. That's inward and outward, okay? God sees on the inside, man sees on the outside. You, you should be holy and separated. God's people have always been holy and separated inwardly and outwardly, unto God and unto Him. Mm -hmm. They live differently, they dress differently, they act differently, they talk differently. Yep. 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 They cuss differently. Come on, somebody. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Okay? They, they, right? Okay? Right. You, you, know, you can tell a real... That is old. See, I fixed to go off down the down, off off the deal. You can tell Bye. a you can tell a real Christian. The old the old grandpa preacher used to say. My wife's old grandpa used to say, "You can tell a real Christian by two things: what they do in the boat in the lake when they're by themselves, right? Amen. Okay, and what they do when they hit their thumb with a hammer. Those two things reveal what's on the inside of the man, right?" What they do when they think nobody's around to see them. Right. And what they say when they hit the thumb on the hammer. Yeah. Just for the record, okay? All right. Oh, I drink water on the boat. <laughs> water on the boat. <laughs> okay. And I quote the books of the Bible when I hit my thumb. And if I get to the Gospels, it's time to quit. <laughs> All, right. All right. All right. And then John the Revelator reveals us the seventh and final aspect of God's spirit deal with men. Revelation 19 and 10. Where are we at? Over here. Okay. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said to me, Do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brother who hold the testimony of Jesus worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of God. Okay. It's an angel. We'll get into this. When we get to Revelation 19, we'll get into this. That John overcome with all, tried to worship the angel. And the angel's like, you better get up, buddy. You're fixing to get us all in trouble, okay? You're not supposed to worship anything but God directly. Somebody right. say amen. amen. But he says, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, okay? And so the ultimate work that the Holy Spirit tries to bring about in a person's life is for them to witness to others with the testimony of Jesus. Jesus' testimony is how he died and was buried and resurrected. Mm -hmm. um, and the testimony in your life is how his death burial and resurrection changed your life, okay? So when you tell a person that they need to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins and be filled with the Holy Spirit, you're literally prophesying to them. You've got the spirit of prophecy because you're testifying and by faith what God could do in their life 
if they would simply identify with Jesus Christ's testimony, okay? Mm -hmm. They died of their sins and identify with his death. If they'd be buried in baptism and identify with his burial and rise again the Holy Spirit and resurrection power, you're testifying that Jesus can make a difference in their life too. And I'll just say this, and we'll come back to this later on in Revelation 19 in another lesson, that if you're studying prophecy, you're out there in SoundCloud land, and you're studying prophecy, and you've got all your beasts and your trumpets straight, and you're not winning anybody to God, you have missed the point, because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Y'all with me here? Right. Okay? So God wants to get us an attitude of spirit of prophecy where we look at people's lives, and we can say, hey, you know what? You may have been a druggie all your life, but God can change your life through the power of Jesus Christ and his testimony, and you don't have to be a druggie all your life. You may have been an alcoholic all your life, or you may have been a, a, a pervert all your life, but God can heal you. You may have been a bank thief, or you might have been, I don't know, uh, you know, what, what some all the stuff. You may have been, hey, depression, I'm back on it. You may have dealt with depression all your life, but you ain't got to live your life always depressed. You're a new creature in life. Wait. Okay. You might have been a preacher's kid all your life. <laughs> so, so to me, I, I, I've taken you through the seven things the Bible refers to the Spirit of God. To me, this is a more biblically sound way than just saying there are seven, uh, seven gods in heaven. Mm -hmm. We can't take every number associated with God and turn into seven persons. Let's not use non-biblical language. Let's the seven spirits of God refer obviously to seven ways that the Bible. Uh, dealing means that God's Spirit wants to work in our life. And if we want to have God's full completion in our life, we'll let His Spirit do all of these seven things. Y'all with me here? Yeah. Yes. Some of y'all who have the Holy Spirit, y'all need to get back to letting it work again. Amen. Five out of seven is not very good. Amen. We need the full completion. Yes. Six out of seven, well, I'll leave it alone. That's the offer plate. All right. You will be glad to know I'm getting back to our study. And that was worth coming to tonight. That was worth the, the price of admission in the Bible study right there. That's right. saying, you know, if you don't get anything else, that back. Your money was well spent tonight. I'm kidding. It doesn't cost anything. Let's get back to our Revelation 4 and 6. The heaven that now is. All right? Y'all with me? Yes. Yes. Revelation 4 and 6. We are somewhere over there. Yes. Before the throne, there was something like a steel glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four little creatures, like the sun, Okay, so in front of the throne, something's like a huge sea of glass, which is great. If you're going to have a sea of glass in your house, that's great. Be sure you got angels to clean it. Can I get an amen? <laughs> uh, something like crystal. And again, I mean, we're going to see some great, accurate pictures in a minute. But John is using terms that he knows, like a sea of glass. I mean, it's the stuff that's beyond any description of anything he's ever seen on earth. He's just trying to describe the heavenlies using a very small vocabulary. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Uh, and like crystal, he says. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. And so he, he's struggling here. He says, they're alive. I know they're alive, okay? And they're some kind of creature, okay? And they've got a lot of eyes. <laughs> full of eyes, okay? I used to think my mom was a living creature. She had eyes in the front of her head, eyes in the back of her head, eyes in the side of her head. <laughs> Yeah, just be at the stove, like, don't do that. And be like, how do you know what I'm doing? <laughs> All right. He's trying to describe it in terms. I mean, he's struggling, but give the guy a break. Sister Mary, uh, Revelation 4 and 7. The first creature was like a lion. The second creature like a calf. The third creature had a face like that of a man. And the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the fourth living creature, each one of them having six wings are full of eyes around and within. And day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creature gave glory and honor and thanks, thanks to him who sat on the throne, now we're going to cut off the sentence. The sentence goes on when, when they say this, then the 24 elders throw their crowns at his feet. We'll read that in a minute, okay? So let, let's kind of come, come around this, okay? And he's using terms. These are some weird looking creatures. What if I say like a lot? Like, like, like a like cat. Face of a man. Like that of a man. Resembles a man. Like a flying eagle. But they have six wings and they're full of eyes around and within, okay? 
So this is very, very interesting. These are some creatures that are unlike anything on earth. I mean, I can't think of anything on earth that has four heads and a lot of eyes. Uh, maybe other than insects, but that'd be a little weird, okay? Uh, yeah, six yes, wings. Now that I think about it, they're just big bugs. I'm kidding. Uh, some of y'all suddenly, right then, somebody just said, I'm not going to heaven. <laughs> He's got big bugs, we're not going there. Jordan, Jordan right now is kind of saying, oh, no. Okay. Um, so these creatures, let's just call them creatures. Everybody say weird creatures. Weird creatures. Um, there is another, there are other angelic references. Ezekiel saw these in Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel chapter 10. It's in your footnotes. And uh, from these scriptures and others, they give hints here and there to God's creation. Um, it, it, and I'm setting you up for something. Most of you know that if I go on and on about something, I'm, I'm heading to a, something worth going, okay? But it, it's very obvious that when God created the heaven and the earth, you think about the diversity of plant life and animal life on the earth. I mean, there's a zillion, there's a zillion animals. You go to, go to the zoo and there's animals you've never seen before. There's animals that have things sticking out their head the wrong way. And there's all kind of, I mean, you think about just deer, okay? We, you know, this is, this is non-scientific. But there's 40 gazillion versions of deer. There's these okapis are kind of like a giraffe and a cow joined together, and there's, or a zebra, or I can't pronounce their names. And there's zebras, which are actually white, uh, white animals with black stripes, because you shave one, they're one. And then there are gazelles, and then there are these other things that I can't pronounce with all these little horns. I mean, there's just a diversity of life. When we get to heaven, apparently, it's going to be quite a, a quite a of variants of angelic beings as well. It's not just going to be standard looking men in white robes with two wings. There's, there's all kind of creatures and things in heaven. Okay? People say, well, we have an eternity. We're going to get bored. I don't think so. I think that there's going to be all kinds of things. Like, have you seen the giraffe angels? The spider angels are coming! I can't make that up. But what I'm trying to get you to see is, I actually am making it up. But what I'm trying to get you to see is there, the Bible is a wide diversity beyond all of these things. Somebody say, yay? Yeah. Yeah. Ezekiel describes another creature that was in the form of a wheel with eyes all upon it that turned kind of like a, a you know, when the, when the person would turn or when the faces would turn, the wheel would kind of stay synchronized. It's, it's hard to imagine. We have no idea what they're talking about. It's really hard to kind of fathom. Everybody say yay? Yeah. 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 Even though I do have some official pictures coming up. Of what these actually look like, but um, um, so we've been leading up to this point. Here's the point. Finally, everybody say, finally got to the point. Most of you say say exasperated. Uh, okay. Here's the deal. Earth, Earth was created and fashioned after heaven. Say that with me. Say Earth, Earth was created and fashioned, fashioned after heaven. Okay, so you got these these weird creatures. It's got a head of a, it's got four heads or at least four sides. To its head, it's got a uh, lion on one side, calf, man, eagle. Yeah, it's, in some way, it's one creature. Um, you got these. You got the twenty-four elders. You got all this stuff, right? Okay. And when we get to, when you get to the time of Mosaic law, I'm not trying to bore you. There's a point to this, and I want you to grasp this. Okay. When you get to the law of Moses and the way that God ordained His people to live in in Moses' time, okay. Every detail on earth was modeled after the reality of the heaven that now is. Right. Okay? Right. For example, okay, in the holiest of holies, okay, mm -hmm. which in itself, what do the angels cry in God's presence? Holy is the one who was. In the holiest of holies was what we call the mercy seat. It's a golden mm -hmm. box which represented God's throne on earth, okay? And it has two engraved uh, cherubims that are facing in, just like we see these these angels facing in, and everything's focusing on that, and that's where the Shekinah presence, the visible presence of God, descended and dwelt in Moses' time. Are you all with me? Yes. So that's kind of like that's kind of like representative of the throne, okay? And if you move out, okay, you realize coming back, comparing John's vision of the real thing in Revelation four and five <coughs> to Moses' tabernacle, you realize that the seven prong golden lampstand. This is the lampstand with seven with seven <laughs> there, you go. there. With seven lamps, okay, represents the seven lampstand, which represented the seven spirits of God and the seven ways that God spirit. Y'all with me here? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then when you get we get on we don't let in the book of Revelation we'll find there's an altar of incense in heaven where the prayers of saints are offered. There's an altar of sacrifice in heaven as well. We'll get there. And so it's important to understand that all these commandments, it seemed like God was very persnickety. But the reason that God was 
somewhat persnickety is because everything on earth was being modeled after the model of the heaven that now is, okay? So then, let's ask this question. What is the earthly representation of the four-headed beast, all right? When we get to Numbers chapter 2, which is not an exciting chapter by most people's standard. Anybody, Numbers chapter 2 is your favorite chapter? No. I thought there would be at least one of you. Well, okay, there's one. Okay. Uh, He's lying. They're, they're lying. Okay. And, and the Numbers, second, number of cha second chapter of Numbers, God gives specific instructions on how the children of Israel were to camp while they were in the wilderness, okay? In other words, when God's presence would stop, they would have to stop, they would have to pitch the tent of the tabernacle, and God's presence would dwell in that. And then they didn't just throw down their, their tents in any certain order. There was a order that God decreased, but a whole chapter of the Bible decreeing this. Y'all with me? Okay? And there was an alignment, okay? And so the temple of the God, where the presence of God dwelt, was in the dead center. Everybody say yay. Yay. The Levites and the spiritual leaders, such as Moses and Aaron, were to camp up against the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. And then the twelve tribes were to camp out, uh, each on one side. <coughs> if you were to go here, uh, Benjamin, Manasseh, and Ephraim were, were this way, um, which would be to the west. And to the north was uh, Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. And to, I think, the east was Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, and then Gad. And the cool thing is, is when he does this, he gives all of the details of how many each there was. That's why it's called the book of <clears throat> Numbers. <laughs> okay? People say, well, it's kind of dumb that way. What you'll find is, is that these, you'll see these numbers are very close to each other. Right. These that are on these three sides. And on the east side, you'll see they were a lot greater because Judah was a much bigger tribe. Mm -hmm. And so every time they pitched their tent, of course, they never knew this because they never saw it from above. But if you were to be able to see heaven's view of them camping in the wilderness, they would have literally been making a shape of the cross in the book of Numbers. Uh -huh. Okay? There's, there's, nothing, there's, nothing, there's nothing by accident in the Bible, okay? That literally was going around, and the reasons why it's set up was, is, is you, had, you had the 24 elders who helped Moses rule over the, over the tribes and camp in here, and the Spirit of God was in the middle with those chairmen and all that. Everything was a portrait of heaven. He was trying to get them aligned and on earth so that so that earth would be as it is in heaven. Yeah. Y'all with me here a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Yes. And what did he promise? If you'll do all these things that I command you, which to carnal minds, some, some of them seem kind of stupid. Why does it matter how, where I want to pitch my tent? Why does it matter what group I'm in? Okay. And the other thing is, all their tents open this way toward the presence of God. You would say, well, there's enemies out there and there's bears in the woods, okay? So we need to face it this way so we can see the enemies know. I want your back to the enemies and you facing me because if you're facing me and if it is on earth as it is in heaven where everything is centered around me, I'll fight your battles. And he says at one place, I'll be your re reward or I'll be your rear guard. I'll take care of your backs as long as you're facing me and sitting to me. Some of y'all came for prophecy and are getting preached to pass the offering plate, baby. Because if you would face, you, you would get your life centered on Jesus Christ and you would get your, your life on, on, on earth as it is in heaven, you would find that he would take care of all these things and bless all these things. God's word tells you to do something and you don't understand why, you need to understand something. You may never understand why, okay, until thousands of years later, but if you would do it, know that you're aligning yourself with the way it is in heaven. Amen. I'm getting a lot of looks like this. We just had spring break, Okay. Now, the other thing is, is that the Jewish rabbis tell us that each of the four lead tribes had a standard or a banner which they raised to represent their position. you got two million of Israelites in the desert. It's kind of tough to see, where are we going? Who's, where, where is Judah? Where are we supposed to be? Okay, So they'd raise a banner up, Okay, the lead tribes on each of the four sides. Y'all with me? Yeah. Uh, Judah, Dan, um, uh, who is this? Reuben, I think, and I can't remember my handwriting. Ephraim? I'm kidding. Okay. Um, and Judah's inside was a lion, okay? So this was the lion side, okay? Ephraim's was a calf, okay? That would be up here, okay? Uh, Reuben's was a face of a man. Reuben is over here. Everybody loves Reuben's. And Dan's was an eagle. Y'all with me here? Okay? And so this is all a model of these weird creatures in heaven. You see what I'm saying? Everything correlates. You say, why is all this in the Bible? Because he was teaching you that if God's will is done, it will be on earth as it is in heaven. Yeah, that's okay? good. All right? Let's go back. Here we go. Revelation 4 and 10. You guys learn anything? You have fun? Amen. Revelation 4 and 10, 11. I have no idea where we are. Where were we? Okay. Over there. The 24 elders will fall down 
throne before him who sit on the throne and will worship him, worship him who lives forever and ever, and will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. Okay, so the twenty. Uh, uh, we'll talk about twenty-four hours a little bit more. Again, but um, they they were they were the next first level, and then the people. And so all of this is just a copy. God was making a miniature of the way it was in heaven. And so now you learn something, right? All right. So this is the setting. Everybody say this is the setting. This is the setting. This is the setting. This is the setting. And and on this, now that John has described the setting in Revelation chapter four, he sees some actions of a play. Remember, this is prophecy, and this is the book of Revelation. Okay, so he's not just here to describe the set. You got to find out what happens on the set, right? Okay, right. and some of this is imagery, obviously. But let's move forward, and he sees the vision of the <coughs> lamb that was slain. So if you've been wondering what this has to do with you, well, you've been not paying attention. But uh, let's go to Revelation five and one, and let's kick up this. Yes. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. Everybody say, sealed up, sealed up. with seven seals. Seven seals. Okay. seals. So God's on the throne, right? In his hand, there is a book that's sealed with seven seals. Now, this is sealed. These are wax seals, okay? These are official wax seals. In those days of kings and stuff, if you wanted to seal something, let's say I'm going to send... I'm going to send a, uh, a letter or a, a decree to Brother Tim, okay? And I don't I only want Brother Tim to, to open it, okay? Then what I would take is I would take some wax. They would usually use a candle or some sort of uh, fire apparatus to make the, melt the wax to a point, not where it's runny, but where it is moldable and malleable and soft and can be. And then the king would have a signet around his neck or around somebody's neck or a, throat, or a ring or some kind of stamp which is his emblem and his official light, typically his likeness, mm -hmm. and he would press it into that wax. Have you ever seen this? Yes. Uh, Sister Michelle Bowen has a cool little thing about, what are you? Yeah, I thought it was you. Yeah, somewhere I've seen, a, uh, somebody got a card, it's like, hey, cool, this is the cool, it's a little wax thing, where she actually takes wax, and it means this is official Queen Michelle, and only those <laughs> it, It's kind of a cool thing now. But back in the day, it would be, I'm just kidding. It, it would be an emblem, okay? You may remember when uh, Jesus was placed in the tomb. And I know I'm kind of leaving prophecy for a second to give you like another parallel in the Bible. Uh, that, that the Pharisees and the religious leaders who had crucified Jesus, they were afraid that the disciples would steal the body of Jesus and they claimed he had been resurrected. And so what did Pilate do? Pilate gave him a seal. They sealed that tomb. In other words, they, they didn't just put Roman guards in front of it, okay? Where, the, where the, the rock hit the edge or the hole, okay, they put a huge glob of wax and put Pilate's signet in there, which basically means if you don't have permission from Pilate, you break this, you've got the wrath of the Roman Empire coming on your hide. Now, it actually backfired because the angel broke the seal because the angel didn't give a rip about what Pilate's, Pilate's seal. He, didn't, he really didn't care, okay? He thumped the Roman soldiers over and they all faint, like, right, okay? <clears throat> right, yeah, but it but it, it backfired because actually nobody in their right mind would go and actually remove the seal, try to steal Jesus' body. Mm -hmm. So it actually proved Jesus' resurrection Amen. because yes. nobody in their right mind wanted to mess with that because it's right. a death sentence. Y'all with me here? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So so what we have is is we have a book. Okay, God has a book or a scroll, as it were. Okay, and the scroll is sealed, which means to be able to open the book and read it. To, which we want, to, we want to see what the book says, right? We want to see what the book says. You've got to peel off the seals, and there are seven of them. So all seven of them have to be taken off before you can fully see what's inside. Mm -hmm. You know what we hear? Am yeah. I making you curious? Yeah. You want to know what's inside? Oh. Well, you have to wait till the seven seals. I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> well, the book is the full revelation of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. The book is, and in, the, in the context of this, is God's redemptive plan and salvation. Okay. So for it to be fully revealed, his complete salvation plan, there has to be seven seals that will be removed for us to see him as he really is. But this is not the book of Revelations. It's the book of Revelation 1. Okay? It's not Walmart. It's Walmart. And it's Revelation. Did y'all catch the missionary there tonight said Revelations? Yes. Yeah, but everybody looked at me. I know, I know. I was like, 
I was picking my nose. I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> I wouldn't look at you because I know everybody's looking at you, okay? Yes, revelation. Get it right. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And it's really the revelation of Christ. This, this vision is the revelation of God's uh, redemptive power and how he had a plan to redeem mankind from the very, very beginning, okay? So we're going to see the cross and the stuff. But in order to be able to see all of this, there these seven seals have to come off. Y'all with me? Yes. So for salvation to be fully revealed to mankind, somebody has to be able to remove the seals. So Revelation 5 and 2, take it away, sir. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. So this is that, and actually good. We're getting upon the Easter season. I want you to think about this. Nobody in heaven or earth, nobody, no man was able to open the book, right? Okay? And nobody was found worthy to break its seals. Okay? So this book represents God's salvation, the plan of redemption, and yet no human being was perfect. No human being was sinless. Nobody was worthy. Somebody say worthy. 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 To break these seals, you had to, you had to match the image of the one who put his image in the seal. Some of you are kind of with me, some of you are not. Okay. In fact, we're talking about the New Testament, we're talking about the Bible says that you are sealed. I'm getting ahead of myself, but this is what in Ephesians, I think it's on the other page. Ephesians 1, I think it is. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Okay. When a person receives the Holy Spirit, they have to first repent and they have, they have to yield themselves to God and they make themselves malleable to, and moldable to God. He comes and tries to recreate them in his image. Okay. So John is weeping because there's no one on earth who bears the perfect image on the seal to be able to peel them off, okay? Mm -hmm. However, as he's weeping, he's weeping greatly. I mean, he's weeping. This is horrible. We've got all this great stuff in this book. Nobody, he's seeing this play. He's into the play, okay? You ever, you ever been in a play and seen somebody in there into it? Yes. They're like weeping with the people or whatever, and you're like, you know, calm down. Take it for a <laughs> second. Okay, Revelation 5 and 5. Take it away, bro. Okay, so obviously this is imagery, right? Mm -hmm. The line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, are both terms <coughs> synonymous for Jesus Christ. Everybody say yay. 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 He's the lion or the leader that came from the tribe of Judah. He's the root of David. David's root also became his, his son. Y'all believe that? Yes. Okay. And so he came from the, the, the kingship theme or the kingship reign of David. And Jesus Christ... Uh, was the one who prevailed to open the book, okay? So John is seeing, John is basically seeing a portrait of Calvary. He's seeing the cross. He's seeing the redemption of God as we see in the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But he's seeing it played out in prophetic terms, okay? So he sees a lamb standing as if slain. So obviously this is, this is not, nobody expects to go to heaven and see a lamb that's dead but walking around with blood all over. Okay, a literal lamb. It, it, it's imagery, okay? And again, I have genuine pictures I'll show you in a minute. But um, these are, these are well, no, somebody else did, but we'll still talk about it. And uh, you, you'll see. And I'm just picking your interest, aren't I? And nobody's going to, when you get to heaven, expect to see a literal lamb standing in the corner dead but walking around, okay? This is imagery, okay? Because what, what, what did it take, listen to me, what did it take for the seals of the full revelation of God and of Jesus Christ to be revealed. What did it take for the world to get full <coughs> revelation of salvation? It took the lamb, a perfect spotless lamb, which refers to Jesus Christ, the Passover lamb. If you've been through all these Bible studies, you're trying to put two and two together. Being slain, right? Mm -hmm. And yet, somehow, getting back to heaven, okay? Which means he didn't stay dead, right? Okay? And... Um, and, of course, it has seven horns and seven eyes. And, again, this is sim symbolic. We, we don't expect to say there are seven persons of God or whatever. But Jesus Christ was the full and complete revelation of God and His Spirit. Right. Y'all with me? Yes. If you want to see, like, what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life, well, it wants to make you like Jesus. Not that you become God in flesh, but that He was our example. Jesus, in every way, let the Holy Spirit flow through flesh without, without compromise. Okay, he let it bring wisdom and understanding. He let it, he let it bring all 
truth, and it will get holy. Are you with me here? Yes. Testify. Yes. So, so Jesus was the seven, that's the seven, the perfect or completion or the fullness of the revelation of God. These are prophetic symbols. We shouldn't take them and make our own theology. However, it, it, it really speaks to us of who Jesus Christ is and Jesus Christ was, okay? So, so when he appears, he's seeing a prophetic vision of what had already taken place in the plan of God. And it's a portrait of God's deal with mankind from the broadest of views, okay? Je Jesus is seeing a visual play with what happened when Christ came to earth. He was coming to give the very life that he took on in order to be able to take the seals off, okay? So next week, we're going to talk about the seven seals. The seven seals are prophetic events. But I want you to understand what this is. This is the very first, okay? Those seven seals could not begin to be revealed to us until the Lamb was slain. Mm -hmm. Because up to that point, there was not a human being worthy to be able to reveal the... You know what I here? Yeah. The actual yes. seven seals are the events of prophecy. And we'll start with <coughs> next week. But the, the events of these, these end time events that were leading to the second coming of Jesus Christ could not take place unless the Lamb came the first time. And so this is a portrait. It's a lot easier to decipher now that we're looking back. Right. Okay. Right, right. But it was it's a broad view of Calvary. You guys having fun or are you bored? Yes, yes. Okay, Revelation five and seven. I don't know where we are. Go ahead, bro. And he came and took a look the right hand of the So the lamb that had been slain came and took the book out of the right hand of the one who sat on the throne. Now, remember, we've already been talking about this. This is imagery. Okay, these are you can't take these numbers and so you can't take this and make God two persons. Any more you can take the seven lamps and the seven spirits of God and make God seven persons. Right. The person is not to identify the identity of God. The purpose is to tell us of did teach us of different ways that God manifests himself to us. Do you grasp this? Yes. Okay. So uh, if, if we were to like take, some people say, well, this proves that Jesus Christ and God the Father are two separate persons. Well, the problem with that is, is if you take the rest of the book of Revelation, it disproves that. Okay. And if right. you take the rest of the Bible, it disproves that too. Let me give you an example. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, according to Revelation 7, 17, the lamb came from the middle of the throne. So where did the lamb, well, we're seeing the lamb after his trip to earth coming back to the throne. Where did the lamb come from in the first place? He came from the middle of the throne, the one throne of whom one sat on it. Are y'all with me here? You grasp what I'm saying here? Okay. And, and, and so we run into some issues if you try to make it. Um, I'm on top of page 6. In Revelation 1 and 8, Jesus said that he is, he said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. That's the first letter of the Greek alphabet, the last letter of the Greek alphabet. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. In Revelation 21, 5 and 6, the one who sat upon the throne speaks and says that he is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. Okay, so Jesus Christ is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. What does that mean? He said, I'm A to Z. I'm, 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 I'm the first, the last, beginning, the ending, A to Z, everything in between. He's saying, I am that I am. I'm comprehensive. I, I, I am God, okay? And if then in Revelation 21, the one who sits on, on the throne, who sits, the one who sits on the throne says, I am Alpha and Omega, beginning and ending, okay? Who's on the throne? Jesus. The Lamb came from the midst of the throne. You see what I'm saying here? So what we see in Revelation 5 is not a dualness of God, but as far as God's person, but it is a dualness in God's relationship to us. That God is a spirit who sits on the throne, did not stay in heaven, but he came to earth. He was manifested in flesh, according to 1 Timothy 3.16, made visible in flesh. Why did he take on flesh? Okay? And, and, and let's, let's, let's have a little fun here. We always say, some people say that God was robed in flesh. And you'll never, you'll never find a scripture that says God was robed in flesh. That's an interesting little, little preacher term I hear people use. Right. Okay? God didn't robe himself in flesh. Once you had a robe. Anybody got a robe with you? No. Just happened in your purse? For sure you got a robe in that, that suitcase? No? Okay. Uh, well, what is that you got? What's that you got in your hand? What is that? Cardigan. Aim that cardigan. Okay. There you go. That works. See, she did have one. <laughs> to robe yourself to robe yourself means you put something on that you're not, okay? Goodness, how do you open the thing? <laughs> Forever 21, I wish. <laughs> okay. If I robe myself, this this is not really me. Okay? God didn't really robe himself in flesh. God became flesh. He was manifested or fully revealed in flesh. Acts 20 28 says that God <coughs> redeemed the church. By shedding His own blood. Yes. Go read it. God redeemed and bought the church with His own blood. How could God, who is a spirit, thank you, I want to spill a little bit. How could, <laughs> how could God, who I just want you to grasp the reality of what the Bible teaches. How could God, who is a spirit, 
give his life and shed his own blood, he had to become flesh. That's why he didn't just suddenly appear one day in the form of a man, okay? God, I'm sure, had, I'm sure in times past when he talked to Abraham, he robed himself in flesh in that sense. He put on flesh quickly, the image of flesh, and then took it off just for the meeting so Abraham wouldn't freak out. Right. Y'all with me? Okay. But when he came to earth in the form of Jesus Christ, he was born of a woman, formed in her womb, yeah. spirit intermingled with flesh. God became flesh, was manifest in the flesh. Right. And so according to Colossians 115, he is the image of the invisible God. Or according to Colossians 2, 8 through 9, in him dwells all the fullness of deity in a bodily form. He intermingled, okay? So the Spirit of God got off the throne and came to be the Lamb so that He could return to the throne and be able to be the one who could rip off the seals of the, of the full work of salvation and redemption and revelation of God's plan to you and humanity. I'm using big terms. Are you all with me? Yep. Are you not with me? Okay? So let, let's move forward a little bit. So this God, John is seeing an allegory or an a, a imagery, a prophetic imagery is probably a better term, of the whole plan of salvation and the cross being acted out, okay? And basically, he's teaching us that without Jesus Christ, we're sunk. Because God's plan cannot be revealed, okay? And so, um, when Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, he was able to take the plan of God and begin to tear off the, the seals. And so, when you, we, again, when we studied these seven seals next week, it was Jesus Christ. He had to come and die and then ascend back to heaven in order for these things to be able to torn off because no one else was worthy to do it. Okay? That's important because Islam teaches that Jesus Christ was a prophet. Right. Just a good man. But Christianity doesn't teach that Jesus Christ was just a good man. It teaches he is the man. Yeah. The right. one God man. Okay? God become flesh, manifest for your purpose. Somebody say yay. Yay. Okay? yay. So um, I think we have uh, one more passage of scripture and then we have some official pictures, which I definitely want to get to because you want to see what heaven is like. <coughs> Revelation 5 8. I have no idea where we are. Go ahead. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp, a golden bowl, and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take this book and to break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood. Man, every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be king kingdom. You have made them to be a kingdom and a priest to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. So we get back to the twenty-four elders. Okay, they begin to praise the Lamb for His work on Calvary. Everybody say yay! Amen. Now you're going to hear a lot of different opinions on twenty-four elders. Mainly because people use the King James Version for prophecy, okay? And I'm not against the King James Version for the first 18, 20 years of my life. That was the only Bible I knew, okay? But one of the weaknesses, probably one of the greatest weaknesses of the King James, is that it used what's called the, the Texas Receptus or the Received Text as for its Greek text, okay? It was compiled by uh, Erasmus. Uh, it, only, it was based off on six Greek manuscripts, okay? And none of those six Greek manuscripts had the book of Revelation in its entirety. In other words, now we have over 5,000 something manuscripts of the Greek, and that's called the critical text, or, you know, we mean here, or the receipt, uh, uh, yeah, the, the critical text. But, okay, the, the received text, the text receptus, was that that he compiled, and that's what the King James used, okay? The problem was none of his six that he had, or five or six that he used, None of them had a full revelation. So he went to the Latin Vulgate, the Catholic Bible, okay, and he translated from the Latin Vulgate back to the Greek. So to put that in perspective, he took a translation that had gone from Greek into Latin, then went from Latin back into Greek, and then the King James took that Greek and went back to English. You ever played the, you ever played the, uh, the game Telephone yeah. where you whisper, you know, you, know, you whisper that says something like, you know, uh, Destiny likes to cut grass, and then she tells her, and then she tells her, she tells her. And before and before it's over, it's like Destiny eats 25 donuts every morning. You know? <laughs> and so the King James makes several, it, the, 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 the translation of Revelation is going through four languages, or has transferred through four languages, okay? So the King James and the New King James says, somebody says, well, where does it matter? Well, it matters right here. In the King James and the New King James, the 24 elders say, uh, worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you purchased for God us from the earth. You have purchased us from the earth. Okay? So in the King James, it makes it sound like the 24 elders were once on earth and have now made it to heaven, which would make them human beings. 
and would also give us rise to believe that human beings are already in the heaven that now is, thus the rapture is taking place. But there is no known old Greek manuscripts which have that rendering. That's, that's the, it's a fault of the King James following the critical text and following the Latin Vulgate. Are y'all with me here? And that's why, other than the King James, the New King James, maybe the MEV, which is also based on the critical text, or excuse me, the received text, the, the, uh, every other translation says that for you have redeemed your blood men from every tribe and you have made them to be kingdom and a priest to our God and, and they will reign upon the earth. So the 24 elders are angelic leaders speaking about human beings who will be saved. Go with me? Yes. Okay? Yes. And that, that's a more accurate translation. That actually matches the Greek. So the point is, if, you, if somebody's like, okay, well, sum it up to me so I don't have to think too hard. Okay, you're welcome. Okay. The 24 elders are not human beings that were redeemed from the earth, like some of you preachers preach. The 24 elders are angelic leaders of worship, and they are talking to God about his work about with men, that he's going to redeem men from the earth, and he's going to redeem them. Are y'all with me? and that they will be kings and priests to our God, okay? So it goes back to our little diagram. The 24 elders are leaders of angelic worship, and they cast their, their crowns before God, and they, they humble Him, but it, it kind of goes out. But eventually they're going to be joined by us because of the work of the Lamb, that one day we're going to join the angels in the heaven that now is worshiping God, and the reason they praise God is because they have seen the portrait of Calvary uh, played out and portrayed in front of them, Okay? setting you up for a long way away. <laughs> Think about that. The Bible says the angels desire to look into it, okay? And so to me, that's a much more biblical view of, uh, uh, of what the 24 elders are. They're simply the leaders of heavenly worship. Y'all with me? Uh, and you can see we're just using the King James to cause people to go into like a preacher view and believe that's the rapture of the church already in Revelation chapter 5 because you've got people in heaven that says you have redeemed us from the earth. The problem is it doesn't match any Greek manuscript. Y'all with me? Yep. Some people tell me, so how do you use the King James? Because, well, there are certain areas of the King James that you're going to get in trouble using the King James because it has some weak translation choices in certain areas. Not key areas, but a few. And prophecy is one of them. Don't send me your hate mail. <laughs> I have no problem with the King James. It's just a dated translation. It was a wonderful translation. It's the first of the teen translations. Yes. Some of you have been to the translation series, so you know my opinion on that. But it, was the, it, it, taught, us, it taught us how to do a translation. And every English translation, I can tell you the faults of. Every one of them has faults and strengths. And it's a matter of knowing the faults and strengths because we're reading the Bible one language removed. Right. Yeah. Okay, so you, you, want, you want to know the strengths and weaknesses of the... So I say, well, what's the weakness of the New American Standard? Well, if you had all night, I'll tell you. Sit around and say, here, I'll tell it to you about it. Or the ESV. I've got a whole translation series on our website. You can... Uh, thejesuschurch.cc, go to Bible Answers, go to Translation Series, it'll take you all the way through it, including the weaknesses and the strengths of the King James Version. But this happens to be a weakness, the book of Revelation. Y'all with me? Yeah. All right, let's get to the end here. Revelation 5 and 11. We've got to hurry. We've got uh, 12 minutes, but we've got to get to some pictures. I mentioned those pictures. Who's reading? Go ahead, bro. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them were was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Yes, okay, so myriads and myriads, thousands of thousands, another way of saying it, gajillion. Okay, it's just words, and they're, just so many, they're incountable, okay? And by the way, I got so caught up in the 24 elders, don't forget what they were saying. They were saying that Jesus Christ was the only man worthy to take the book of redemption and open, open it. He's the only one that was sinless that could open up the full plan of God right. to us. Amen. Again, the sinner becomes back on Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen? amen. So, again, you can see there's only millions of angels. So, you see the little Israelites, two million in the wilderness. That's a small sample of what heaven's going to be like. And we're going to get to join them. Somebody say yay? Amen. amen. In Revelation 5.13, let's finish it up so we get to those, those, uh, those pictures. No, we're kicking it up right here. Will? Okay. And every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. 
And the elders fell down and worshipped. Okay, so every created thing. So there's obviously a great multitude of different created beings. Everybody say yay? Yay. And they all worship the Lord. Okay, so this is how it should be on earth as it is in heaven. Everybody should, should praise God. We should give God the glory for that. We should always say amen or let it be. Whatever he has spoken. And we should all be willing to worship him. Everybody say yay? yay. All right, I have some pictures here. Now, these are Legos. <laughs> and uh, this is the story of tonight, Revelation 4 and 5. Just because I have a quirky sense of humor, um, told with Legos. So this was uh, the one that's out of the, the Ancient of Days. A little bit of space needle there as well. And then you have the, uh, there's the seven spirits of God right there before the 24 elders, or some of the 24 elders. And the sea of glass. Somebody was pretty good at this. Um, and uh, you have the eagle, the lion, the calf, and the human face. And they have eyes everywhere. It's just as biblically accurate as any movie. Yeah. Even more so, perhaps. Yeah. I don't know if God was like Santa Claus, but I mean, it's uh, <laughs> so just to give you some detail of the eyes, and it has the four, uh, the, the wings, the six wings, and uh, there is well, and uh, the, man, the man angel is very happy, and the eagle, and the angel with a six pack of abs there, he's working to open the scroll and break the seal. Look at this scroll. And uh, there's a scroll with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Come on, Hollywood. Yeah. And uh, John is crying. <laughs> 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 to tear off the seals. You guys' lives are enriched because of this. And this is the lamb that was slain. <laughs> seven eyes and seven horns. <laughs> That's very very biblically accurate in the blood yeah. because he was these men and his kill, right? It's creepy. Uh, it's pretty accurate. And uh, they say, <laughs> and um, there you go. Hopefully, you learned something tonight. In Jude, we find him writing in verse 3 I wanted to write of our common salvation, but he said, I realized it was necessary for me to write to you of the faith which was once delivered to the saints. It's very specific in Greek. It was delivered once for all. We do not have an evolving gospel that needs to be updated with the latest theories of psychology and sociology and legality. But we have the faith which once for all was delivered to the saints. It saved people in the first century. It saves people in the 21st century.